Thank you. Now, you can see the title of my talk is 25 Years in the Life of a Neuroendocrine Tumor Patient. And the reason I picked that to uh, topic is actually the very first patient I ever embolized at Penn when I came in 1991 was a patient with metastatic neuroendocrine tumor who called me. He'd been uh, diagnosed, he had been treated at the Mayo Clinic, and had uh, moved to Philadelphia. And he knew it's what he needed, so he just called Penn because he figured someone there knew how to do this stuff. Um, and I started treating him, and he lived for 25 years. Uh, now, obviously, that wasn't just all my doing. I did embolize him uh, 16 times over a dozen years, um, but obviously, he got every other possible treatment available during his lifetime um, and made it for 25 years from his diagnosis. So, to me, he's sort of one of my heroes, um, and I view every new neuroendocrine tumor patient I meet with, with that philosophy in mind that we're, gonna, we're going for 25 years. Um, so, that, that's the, uh, where the title comes from. Let's see if I can make this computer work. Yahoo. Okay, so mostly what I talk to you today is about liver-directed therapy, that is treatment of liver metastases, uh, who, who we should and should not treat, uh, who um, various ways we can do it, uh, some of the complications and outcomes, and alternatives. And one of the things that um, we want to think about when we're treating uh, liver metastases is we're looking at patients who have unresectable but liver-dominant disease. So one of the first questions we ask, is it resectable, because a surgeon may be able to remove it, uh, potentially for cure, and then you don't need me. So we treat the patients, the surgeons can't. And then the hand, we're usually treating people with liver dominant disease, meaning that the bulk of their tumor is in the liver, it's not disseminated all over their body, and we think that by treating the disease just in the liver, that's somehow gonna be beneficial for the patient. It's very important to understand that we're not silos. We all work as part of a multidisciplinary team, as Dr. Warner emphasized. I think it's incredibly important that you ha all have access to this, uh, at least for some guidance in terms of therapy. You don't necessarily have to go to you know, New York or Philadelphia to get treated, um, but you want to access a multidisciplinary team of experts in this disease for guidance on therapy, and then hopefully you can access that therapy in a more convenient location if you don't happen to live near one of these centers. Uh, at Penn, we have a multidisciplinary neuroendocrine tumor board. Uh, Doug Fraker is our chief of surgical oncology. Uh, Dave Metz is one of our guest neurologists who specializes in neuroendocrine tumor, or senior title bomb in medical oncology. We have a group of radiation oncologists that specialize specifically in GI and pancreatic malignancies. We have diagnostic radiologists, interventional radiologists, um, and then various other specialists as needed for patients' particular problems. Um, so you want to be able to access a group like that um, at whatever stage of your disease. So I like to sort of structure this talk by just kind of taking a basic patient, the typical patient who just shows up in my clinic one day who has metastatic neuroendocrine tumor to the liver, and we'll kind of walk through what our thought process is uh, when we see a new patient. So here's a very typical patient who presented to me a year or two ago. Uh, uh, was instantly diagnosed on a CAT scan done for other reasons with multiple masses in the liver, had a biopsy that demonstrated this to be uh, a carcinoid tumor. Based on the stains, they thought it was probably of gut origin, although no primary was identified. He had uh, his MRI that you see on the left with sort of the one bulkiest tumor in the medial segment of the left lobe, and then multiple other small lesions scattered throughout both lobes of his liver. He also had an Actria scan, which again confirmed these multiple hepatic lesions and also failed to identify a primary. He feels fine. Right? His performance data, such as the term we use to describe the well-being of the patient, is zero, meaning he's completely normally functioning with no limitations and no symptoms. His liver function is entirely normal, as are all his other labs. So what do you do with a patient like this? Asymptomatic, normal liver function. Right? You can't make somebody better than normal. You can certainly make them worse. Um, so one of the thing, questions comes to mind is, should you do anything? Do you just observe a patient like this? Do you put them on sandostatin? Do you send them to surgery? Or do we start attacking these liver metastases with some ablative or intraarterial therapy? And the, the two key issues really are initiation of sandostatin therapy and surgical debulking. You can hear a lot more about surgery later, but I'm just trying to emphasize that this is the thought process I go through. You know, I look at it and say, could this person pot potentially be resectable? Now, if I back up to the picture, you know, many people might look at this and say, gee, this patient's got probably you know, 10 or more lesions scattered in every segment of the liver. There's no way he's resectable. And if this was metastatic colon cancer, I would agree. 
But in neuroendocrine tumors, I wouldn't necessarily agree because a aggressive surgical approach would be to remove the entire left lobe of the liver, including that giant lesion, and then go through the right lobe with a fine tooth comb and enucleate or ablate every little spot you could find. And that, unlike in other kinds of cancers, might be beneficial in someone with a neuroendocrine uh, type tumor. So I would definitely want my patient to have a surgical oncologic consultation to see whether the patient could be either curatively treated or at least extensively debulked uh, by a surgical approach. And that's based on at least historical data saying that if you can completely resect liver metastases, the five-year survival is three times as good compared to patients who present with the exact same tumor burden and don't have surgery. Now, obviously, no one's done a randomized trial where people prospectively got sent to surgery or not, but based on historical data, it does seem like patients who can be aggressively surgically debulked, even if it's not curatively, uh, will live much longer than patients who are not. So a surgical oncologic consultation, I think, is key, really, in everyone who presents with liver metastases. So I'll move on to question two. What's the indication for starting sandostatin? Should everybody get it? Only symptomatic patients, only patients who have positive actria scan showing their tumors actually take up the somatostatin? Or do you reserve it for progressive disease or patients who you think are at high risk of progressive disease because they have a high mitotic index or a high K67? And Dr. Warner mentioned the PROMID study. This was a randomized trial done in France where they took 85 patients and they either gave them sandostatin injections monthly or a placebo injection. And Clearly, there was benefit in terms of control of progression of disease in patients who got the sandostatin. So the time to tumor progression was over a year in patients who got it versus half a year in patients who did not, highly significant. Um, at six months time, two-thirds of the patients who got sandostatin were stable, only one-third of the placebo group were stable, and it didn't matter whether they were symptomatic, and it didn't matter whether they had an elevated chromogranin A. So basically, the conclusion of that is everybody should get sandostatin, and this is just the time to event curve. The yellow is the patients who got sandostatin, the blue is not, and you can see how the blue line pitifully drops to zero with everyone by two years having progressive uh, symptoms or tumor, whereas you had much better control in the patients who got sandostatin. So that's our recommendation uh, based on this data. Unfortunately, as I learned at the NANAS meeting last month, not all insurers buy into this, and so not everyone can get access to this therapy paid for. Um, but that is the, our sort of recommendation, our goal for, for patients, is to get them all on sandostatin no matter what. Okay, so in this case, the patient went on sandostatin, didn't want surgery, and he was asymptomatic, normal liver function. His tumor burden was pretty low, so we just watched him. And we ser do serial scans about every three months for the, you know, over the course of the first year. And after about a year goes by, we finally find his primary. So a, a follow-up CT scan detects a mass in his small bowel, common site of a primary tumor. Um, he's still asymptomatic, so this primary tumor that we now see isn't causing obstruction, isn't causing bleeding, his liver disease has been relatively stable, he's still, he's still asymptomatic. So the next question is, what do you do about this primary? Should you remove it or should you leave it alone, just like we're leaving his liver alone? And again, the answer based on historical data, and Dr. Palmi will talk more about this, based on his own data, is that you should remove it. That prophylactic removal of a gut primary is associated with better long-term outcomes, because even though the tumor in the bowel is asymptomatic now, we know that over years it goes on to cause metastases in the mesentery and the lymph nodes, it causes fibrosis, it causes obstruction of the bowel, causes ischemia of the bowel, causes GI bleeding. And in fact, historically, patients who get their primary resected, even if it's already metastasized to the liver, live two to three times longer on average than patients who do not. So we do recommend uh, resection of the GI primaries. A little bit more controversial is what you do with the pancreatic endocrine tumors. If you find a primary in the pancreas that's already metastasized, should you remove that? And that is a little less clear cut. Okay, so as it turns out, this patient is very averse to surgery, so he, he refused his bowel surgery also. But he's doing fine, and we're kind of tracking him along, and another several months goes by, and now serial imaging demonstrates progression of his disease. So now his index lesions that he presented with are a little bigger, and he's got some new lesions in his liver. He's still asymptomatic. His liver function is entirely normal. So now what do we do? Bump up a sandostatin because he's progressing on his existing dose. Now we send him back to surgery. He doesn't want surgery. Do we attack his liver directly at this point with some image-guided therapy, or should he consider some sort of systemic therapy? So this is sort of the controversial point. I really don't know what the right answer is. There are uh, different philosophies on this. 
there are a couple clear-cut indications for starting liver-directed therapy for liver metastases. One is if they have hormone-related symptoms that are refractory to medical therapy. So you put them on sandostatin, they're still having flushing, still having diarrhea, or whatever other symptoms they have, depending upon the type of primary neuron tumor they have. So if they have uncontrolled symptoms, you should definitely treat their liver tumors because you will 90% of the time get symptom control. If the tumor starts to affect the liver function, so you see the liver function blood tests are no longer normal, well, you know, the most common cause of death in patients with liver dominant metastases is progression of the tumor until the liver fails, and you don't want that to happen. So if it's starting to affect liver function, you definitely need to treat them. But what happens if neither of those things, like this patient, liver function's normal, he has no symptoms, at what point should you treat them to keep him out of trouble? We used to think that you could let the tumor bulk grow until it was half the liver, and you still had kind of plenty of time to treat them, but it turned out that wasn't always the case. We got burned on some patients many years ago because sometimes the imaging underestimates the disease. This can be a very indolently progressive tumor. It can sort of infiltrate through the liver in ways you don't really see on a CAT scan of MRI, and you can sort of underestimate the tumor burden. And there were some patients we sort of let go because they had completely normal liver function, no symptoms, until they had fairly bulky tumor. We treated them, and the treatment put them to liver failure, and they died. And then it turned out on autopsy, like 90% of their liver was occupied by tumor. You just didn't see all that on the scans. So now we say maybe we should do it a little sooner. Somewhere between a quarter and a, and a half liver volume is probably a reason to treat. That being said, not everyone thinks that way. Some people um, you know, think you should treat much, much earlier, sort of a more surgical approach, like debulk as much as you can as soon as you can. Um, so this is really a controversial point, and it's kind of a judgment call. <coughs> so, why the hepatic artery, if we're going to talk about uh, treating these patients? Um, it was recognized in the 1950s that there was differential blood supply to the liver parenchyma, um, that the liver gets about 75% of its blood from the portal vein, that giant blue vein, the size of a hot dog that drains the blood from your whole gut to your liver. And then you have the artery, which supplies only about 25% of the blood to the liver, but it gives almost 100% of the blood to the tumors. And when people figured that out in the 50s, in the 1960s, they started doing treatment directed through the artery. So, intraarterial chemotherapy, which greatly increased the response rate, and then embolization, including the artery, or surgically ligating it came along, and then finally more advanced forms of embolization, um, which is going to, I think, getting cut off the slide there. Okay. Chemoembolization was developed around 1980 in Japan for treatment of primary liver cancer. And since then, it's disseminated all over the world for treatment of primary and secondary malignancies. So what's exciting about chemoembolization? Well, it does multiple things. One, you're embolizing. You're actually plugging up the artery of the tumor. So you're cutting off the blood supply of the tumor. It starves them of oxygen and nutrients. It makes most of the tumor die. When you mix chemotherapy drugs with this, they greatly increase the concentration of drug delivered to the tumor. So instead of giving the drug IV, where the tumor sees a little bit, you inject it in the artery feeding it, and it sees 20 to 200 times the concentration of drug that it would get if it was given systemically. Plus, you cut off the blood flow at the same time. So you trap that drug in, in the liver for weeks. So these tumors see a lot of drug for a long time. And because you trap much of the drug in the liver, the body sees relatively little of it, so you decrease the sy systemic toxicities. All right, so who should not be treated with embolization therapy? There's almost no absolute contraindications. One is if you don't have good enough liver function. All right, which is a very unusual situation in patients with neuroendocrine tumors, something we face much more often in patients with primary liver cancer. But if you have a combination of blood test results, a very elevated LDH, an AST over 100, a totally bilirubin over 2, and half your liver replaced by tumor, you almost certainly die if you get embolized. So people who have all of those, we generally don't offer this therapy. Also, remember, we're occluding the artery to the liver. So you have to have blood flow from that portal vein to the liver. So we need to know that that portal vein is open and blood's flowing to the liver. Again, unusual for that not to be the case in patients with endocrine tumors, much more commonly a problem in patients with cirrhosis and primary liver cancer, but we want to know that. There's some relative contraindications, so bile duct obstruction. So the bile ducts, like the tumors, have an end arterial blood supply, meaning they don't get blood from the portal vein. So when you embolize the artery of the liver, you're hurting the bile ducts too. Now normally the bile ducts are quite tolerant of that, but if you have bile duct obstruction, say from the tumor and dilated bile ducts, the bile ducts will necrose, and you'll get big bilomas, lakes of bile in the liver, which may get infected. Even worse, 
is patients who've had prior surgery or endoscopy where they've had a Whipple procedure, not uncommon in patients with pancreatic, tumor, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. Uh, so the bile duct has been cut and sewn back into the bowel, or they've had an endoscopist do a sphincterotomy and put a stent up there. At the bottom of the bile duct, there's a valve, a one-way valve that allows the bile to flow into the GI tract, but not the stuff from your GI tract to come up into your bile ducts. If that valve's been cut, then the bugs that normally live in your GI tract now live in your bile ducts, which doesn't bother you until I embolize them. And then when you embolize them, the bile ducts necrose, and all those bugs get in your liver and you get a liver abscess. Um, and that used to happen 100% of the time until we figured out about 10 years ago that was a problem. Now we do super duper antibiotics, and we still get a liver abscess about a third of the time. So it's a significant risk to the procedure in those patients. Doesn't mean you can't do it, but you need to think about that. And then extra pack disease I put in there just to remind us that you want to treat patients who have liver dominant disease. So you have widespread disseminated disease, it might be futile to treat the liver and that would be a reason not to do it. So pretreatment evaluation. Well, we need good CT, MR of the liver so we know exactly where the tumors are. We do a metastatic workup uh, looking for tumor elsewhere, which could be in a TRIA scan, chest CT. Uh, typical labs to make sure that all the organ function is adequate to be treated, tumor markers like chromogranin A, and then we meet in the office, we review all this data, we discuss all the possible therapies, the toxicities of the therapies, the benefits and risks. Uh, we have informational brochures on all these things for patients, and then if you want to do it, we do consent. Patient preparation, uh, if you're going to come in for such a procedure, you have to be NPO, so I mean nothing by mouth except for your meds. You come in into the hospital, we get you changed, we plug in an IV, we hydrate you vigorously so we can keep your urine flowing and wash all the evil humors out of your body. You get pre-medicated with antibiotics, anti-nausea medicine, sedatives, and we, we give a big subcutaneous injection of sanostatin to prevent any kind of reaction during the embolization, something that I've never seen, and according to Dr. Pommier, probably is a waste of time. Uh, and then we often will put in a Foley catheter uh, just because we're going to be flooding you with fluids. You're going to have to pee a lot and you're going to be flat in bed for at least six hours. Um, so that's sort of optional. Then we do uh, liver, very careful liver angiography, meaning we're mapping the blood supply of the liver. So the liver has a right lobe and a left lobe. We know from your scans where your uh, tumors are. Um, in the simplest case, there's one main artery of the liver that splits into a left branch and a right branch. But only half of people are simple, and the other half are more complicated. So some people have three arteries to the liver. You can have arteries from your stomach to your liver, your intestines to your liver. We just have to kind of map out your plumbing. And we also look for, in addition to variant anatomy, we look for branches that may feed the liver but have branches to the gut. So there are a number of arteries that actually come off arteries going to the liver that don't go to the liver. They go to your pancreas or your stomach um, or gallbladder, things that we really don't want to embolize. Uh, we confirm that you have portal blood flow to your liver. Uh, and then, making sure we know where the tumor is, we selectively catheterize the portion of the liver that has the tumor and embolize it. So here's a typical procedure. I don't know if we can get an arrow up here or not. Yes. All right, so this is a digital subtraction angiogram, meaning the black stuff is the x-ray dye we've injected in the arteries and everything else has been subtracted out, so all you see is the arteries. The little white line you faintly see here is the catheter coming up from the leg. And this is the celiac artery, the first main branch of the aorta in the abdomen that feeds the stomach, the spleen, and the liver, and some of the pancreas. Oops, let me see if I can go back. Rats. Hold on. It's not going back. Let's see if I can get it to uh, previous, uh, previous, one more, yes, okay. Uh, so this patient has a number of variations. So this big artery coming up here is the artery of the stomach called the left gastric artery. This figure seven you see here is a, the most common variation where an artery to the left lobe of the liver comes off the artery of the stomach. Okay. This is what we call the common hepatic artery. It's splitting into three branches. This is another artery of the left lobe of the liver. This is an artery of the right lobe of the liver. This is an artery that goes to the duodenum and stomach and pancreas. And this is an artery that goes to the stomach. So if this patient, and you notice we don't really see the tumors on the angiogram, we don't see any big light bulbs lighting up in there in this particular case, but if we knew from the patient's CAT scan or MRI that there was tumor uh, throughout the liver, you'd have to treat the patient three different places. We'd have to thread a catheter out here, pass the branches to the stomach, treat this part of the left lobe. We have to thread a catheter up here, pass this branch to the stomach to treat the rest of the left lobe. And we have to thread a catheter up that right branch to treat the right lobe. So here we are, we've now advanced the catheter up into the right lobe artery. Let's see if I can get the arrow back. Hello, arrow. Maybe not. There, here it comes. Okay, so this little area of spasm here is where the tip of the catheter is. You know, my fellow did it, not me. 
We've injected contrast again before we give any nasty stuff into the artery to be sure there's no surprises. So we've injected pretty hard, so there's some reflux backward. But if you look sort of forward from that point, what you see is another little branch hanging down that we didn't see before. So that's very important because sometimes on the less selective injection, you don't see everything. Now they're out selectively, we see this other little branch descending from the right hepatic artery, which is the artery of the gallbladder. And although it's safe to embolize the gallbladder, it makes you feel a lot worse. In fact, it's the only thing that predicts how sick you get after an embolization in terms of the severity and duration of symptoms of pain and nausea is whether you embolize the gallbladder or not. So if you can miss the gallbladder, it's a kindness. Uh, and in this case, we would just advance that catheter out another few centimeters, get past the branch of the gallbladder, and then deliver our therapy to the right lobe. So then what happens? So we inject our chemoembolic goo, we take the catheter out, you have some hours of bed rest, we keep you hydrating you vigorously to wash out all the evil humors coming out of your liver, you get IV antibiotics, IV anti-nausea medicine, pain medicine is needed, and then we advance your diet as, as your stomach feels. Uh, if you had a fully catheter in, we take that out in the morning, and then as soon as you can eat, drink, and pee on your own, you go home. Most people go home the next day, some people are two-day people, and you're either a one-day person or a two-day person every time we do this. Okay, follow up. We get your blood work in about three weeks to make sure your liver is recovered. So we did, you know, do some transient unhappiness in the liver when we embolized the hepatic artery. Were we checking your blood test, we would see that your liver function would spike up and peak at three to five days. It should be back to baseline by 10 to 14 days. So basically at three weeks, we check your blood work, make sure everything's recovered. And then if you need another lobe treated, we do that in about four weeks. Uh, doesn't have to be four weeks. That's just the soonest most people are really ready to do this again. Uh, you know, if you're not feeling up to it or you have a wedding or a vacation or something, we can postpone it. Nothing magic about four weeks. When we're done all your treatments, and each time it feels the same to you, no matter what part of the liver we're in, again, we'll repeat your blood work in about three weeks. We image it four weeks and see you in the office. And if we're happy with the outcome, then we follow you along about every three months the first year. If you're stable at a year, we go to every four months. If you're stable at two years, we go to every six months. If you relapse in the liver, we can do this again. So unlike with systemic chemotherapy, for example, where if the tumor progresses, it means it's not working. That's not the case with embolization therapy. It just means that whatever didn't kill the first time around or appeared afterward now has a new blood supply, can grow again, and we can go back. And if it, you know, the therapy worked the first time, it'll work on the recurrence. And you get these really dramatic responses. So this is a pre and post MRI on a patient. The big white things are the tumors. So you can see on the left-hand image that almost the whole liver was taken up by these massive metastases. And six months later, after chemoembolizing one, you know, one's gone, basically, and the other one's shriveled down to a fraction of its former size. So neuronal tumors are very, very responsive to therapies where you're including their blood supply, such as chemoembolization. This is data just from our own institution. The green lines are the carcinoid patients, and the red lines are sort of the non-carcinoid or islet cell patients. Um, and the top left curve is survival from the time they were initially diagnosed. And you can see that it averages around 10 years uh, or longer. Um, the top right curve is survival from the time the liver metastases were diagnosed. And again, we're seeing that the median, the average time, is about 10 years. Uh, for both diseases. And then the, the bottom curve is from when we started actually embolizing patients, which typically is much later than when the disease first appeared, because we don't embolize them until they need it. And we see that in the carcinoid patients, uh, our median survival is around five years and somewhat less for the islet cell patients. Now, I want to emphasize that this is the unique data from my own institution. If you, for example, looked at an almost identical report from the Andy Anderson Cancer Center in Texas, the curves are reversed. Their islet cell patients did better than their carcinoid patients. So, you know, I don't think we really know exactly whether one group's truly different from the other because you get different outcomes from different centers. What doesn't matter? Well, on the left-hand curve, we looked at timed regression after embolization comparing patients who had hormonally active tumors versus the ones who are not. And the curves are basically the same, so it didn't matter. Uh, the right-hand curve is comparing patients who did or did not have disease outside their liver when we treated them. And again, there was really no difference uh, between the two. So as long as you choose your patients carefully, the ones that truly have liver-dominant disease, the fact that there was some disease outside the liver didn't really affect their survival, emphasizing the importance of controlling the disease in the liver. Most people with liver-dominant malignancies die of liver failure. And if you control the tumor in the liver, you keep them from dying. Okay. So how you treat, how, what kind of embolization you're going to do. So I want to just do a few slides kind of putting to rest the whole bland versus chemoembolization discussion. So bland embolization means you're injecting little particles in the hepatic artery. You're just occluding the blood flow of the tumors. Very effective therapy has been around since the 1960s. These tumors are so vascular that just cutting off their blood flow will get a dramatic response in 90% of the time. 
Uh, so it's hard to improve upon 90% response rate, and key mobilization, in fact, does not. They work similarly well up front. The difference, at least in data from Penn, was that the duration of that control was much better with key mobilization. So you can see that in the patients who got bland embolization, every single patient progressed within 12 months. So the disease started coming back again. Whereas in chemo mobilization, half the patients had no progression at one year, and in fact, a third of the patients had no progression at three years. So in our experience, chemo mobilization provides much more durable tumor control than bland embolization does. We saw a similar trend if you look at survival with the two, but that difference, although it seems like the chemo mobilization patients do better, A, wasn't really statistically significant, and B, it's sort of contaminated data because there's a lot of crossover, meaning if people got bland embolization and didn't get good disease control, they switch to chemo mobilization. So many patients end up getting both eventually, and so the survival data isn't really pure. Uh, one of the myths about this is that somehow adding the chemotherapy makes it a more toxic procedure, and that is absolutely not true. All right? The toxicity of embolizing the liver is from the embolization, from cutting off the blood flow. It's the ischemia. It's not the drugs. So if you look at grade three toxicities, you know, the, there's a standard five-point grading scale for toxicities. If you look at, and three is sort of moderately bad, the incidence of grade three toxicities in the chemo arm and the bland arm was the same you know, low 20%. The length of stay in the hospital was identical. So you don't get sicker with chemo mobilization than you do with bland embolization. So that's, there's no reason not to do chemo mobilization in, based on that argument. Okay. What about other forms of embolization such as radioembolization? So radioembolization is a completely different approach. We still use the hepatic artery as our delivery path to get the therapy to the tumors, but instead of injecting chemotherapy drugs that are mixed with a thick oil and big you know, plastic particles to choke off the blood supply, instead we're infusing millions or tens of millions of tiny, tiny little glass or plastic beads. They're only 25, 30 microns in size. So small that the concept is they'll actually not occlude the arteries in the liver. They'll sail right through them and actually get embedded in the tumor vessels. At least that's what the companies want you to think. And they have beautiful pictures of your brochures showing cartoons of beads all through the tumors. Not that we have any idea if that really happens. These beads are impregnated with yttrium 90, one of the radioactive substances that Dr. Warner mentioned, which is a very powerful emitter of beta radiation. Beta radiation is very heavy. It can only travel two or three millimeters. So around each bead, you're getting a very potent dose of radiation, but it's so heavy, it can't get out of the liver. It can't get out of your body. The dose we deliver is based on the volume of, uh, of liver and tumor in that part of the liver that we calculate from a CAT scan. And then when you're planning any kind of radiation-based therapy, you need to do what's called a simulation or a practice run to determine if you can actually deliver this safely and effectively. So if we're planning radioembolization instead of chemoembolization, you start out coming to the hospital, getting the catheterization, mapping out the plumbing of your liver, steering our catheter out into the part of your liver we want to treat, and then the first day we do a test injection of some mildly radioactive albumin beads called technetium MAA, and that mimics a treatment like we're pretending we're treating you. And then we take the catheter out, and we roll you up to nuclear medicine, and they do a spec CT, a nuclear medicine scan fused with a CAT scan that shows us where did our test injection go? Did it target the tumors? Was there nothing coming out of the liver through tiny branches to the, might have gone to the pancreas or stomach that we didn't see in our angiogram? And most importantly, these beads are so, so tiny that they don't all get filtered out by the liver. Some will pass through the liver and back out and end up in the lungs. That happens in everybody to some degree. But usually it's less than 5% of the dose which is fine. But the lungs have a limited radiation tolerance. So some people, especially with very vascular tumors, may send 10, 20, 30 percent what you inject in the liver, shunts through the tumors and ends up in the lungs. And if too much of, these, of this test injection goes to the lungs, it tells us we can't give you the hot beads. Or if it's maybe an intermediate amount of shunting to the lungs, maybe we have to drop the dose to the liver so that we don't deliver too much to the lungs. So that's all the information we get from this evaluation. So here, for example, are images where we're calculating the volume of the right lobe of the liver and then calculating the volume of the left lobe of the liver. This is what the nuclear medicine scans look like. So these are both patients where we catheterized the artery of the right lobe of the liver and we injected our little technetium tracer to mimic a therapy. And on the left-hand image, you can see is here's the right lobe of the liver. The three black dots are just external markers, so you know where the patient is. And up here in the chest, you don't see anything. So this patient had little or no shunting to the lungs. Look at this patient. So this again, this is all the activity in the right lobe. You could actually faintly see 
the left and right lungs. So this patient had a larger degree of shunting to the lungs than the first patient did. And what they do in nuclear medicine is they actually draw volumes around these things. They can calculate the fraction of the activity injected that ended up in the lungs. And that comes back to me as a report the next day saying it was 5%, it was 10%, whatever. And then I can use that information to do the dose calculation based on the volume of liver we're treating and the shunt fraction of the lungs and determine, A, can I do it safely? And if I can, what dose do we have to give? And then you come back about two weeks later, because it takes about two weeks to get these doses. Uh, one company, the product comes from Can Western Canada, the other comes from Australia. So they have to fly these little hot things. They come FedEx every now and then, and then the FedEx Center in Memphis loses one. And you sort of wonder where all this reactive material is, uh, somewhere lost in the country. And we worry about terrorists. I think you should worry about Certex. Um, or FedEx anyway. Um, anyway, so we get the dose, usually arrives on time, and we basically just recatheterize you, so we put our catheter right back where we were the last time, and we have a fancy apparatus set up so we can safely infuse these things without exposing ourselves or you. There's radiation safety officer in the room monitoring everything with Geiger counters to make sure we don't spill anything. So there's a lot of rigmarole around the procedure from a radiation safety standpoint, but from the patient standpoint, it's just like the first procedure. You're just laying on the table, you get catheterized, we inject the beads, you can't feel it, we take the catheter out, you have four hours of bed rest, and you go home. So both stage, stages of this are an outpatient procedure, um, unlike chemomobilization where because of the toxic side effects, you actually have to be in the hospital for um, a day or two. Okay. So what's the, what do we know about the benefit of radioactive, radioactive bead embolization or endocrine metastases? Um, there are sort of several small series from various centers, so it's not a huge amount of data like we have for chemoembolization. This therapy's only been around for about 10 years, uh, and less than that available for treating metastatic disease. Um, the largest series is this one uh, report from 2008 where about eight different centers pooled their data, 148 patients. Uh, it was sort of an early report. They had grade three toxicities in about two thirds of patients, which is actually seems awful high. Most patients tolerate this therapy quite well. They had very impressive disease control. So you can see that although the rate of complete response, that is the tumors disappearing was only 3%, there were 60% had some regression of their tumor, 23% had stable disease, and only 5% of patients actually progressed after reactive bead therapy. So 95% of patients had disease control, the majority of which were responses. And their median survival was 70 months, so very similar to what you see with chemoembolization. Many patients get up, end up getting both of these therapies eventually. So you know, one of the questions is, well, if you were someone who started out being chemoembolized and you had these procedures, we were actually plugging up arteries into your, in your liver, or at least the tumors, can we then go back and deliver the reactive beads afterward? And the answer, as far as we know, is yes. So there was one early report from MD Anderson, and then the, the data you see here is actually from my own place that we just reported at the World Conference on Interventional Oncology this year, where we had about a dozen patients who got SERSPHERES for progression after being previously chemoembolized. Um, and we saw a 60% five-year, first of all, you could definitely do it. There's no problems administering the therapy. Uh, responses are just what we expected. Median survival was, again, 70 months, just as you saw with virgin patients. So, you know, my sort of take home on the chemobilization versus yttrium question is, based on the available data, they've never been compared head to head, they work about the same. So their effectiveness in tumor control is similar, and they're similarly safe, meaning that the risk of something bad happening, a complication, is similar. So from a medical standpoint, I think it can go either way. The big difference is, is really from the customer standpoint is chemobilization works fast, but you get sicker. Yttrium therapy is slow, but you don't get as sick. And so it's kind of up to you, and you can get them both sequentially over your lifetime. Right? Each one has its limitations. So if you're talking about getting yttrium therapy, there is a lifetime dose of reactivity to your liver and your lungs that you eventually reach. So you can only do yttrium therapy so many times in your life, and then you have to stop. And typically, that's going to be three-ish. It sort of depends upon the dose you're getting and how much is going to your lungs. So, and what you end up seeing in these patients that you treat more than one time is you get a radiation fibrosis in the liver and you get sort of a cirrhotic pattern in the liver. So they actually get these shriveled little livers and, and they get the same sort of late consequences that people with cirrhosis get if you get a lot of big radiation dose to your liver cumulatively over time. Um, chemobilization in theory can be repeated indefinitely in practice. The arteries have to stay open, right? You have to have plumbing to get there. So the goal of chemobilization is that you kind of, every time you do it, you're pruning the tree. You're trying to just knock off the little tiny tumor feeding vessels, but leave the segmental and lobar arteries open so when the tumor inevitably recurs, you can go back and do it again. In practice, if you prune a tree too many times, the tree dies. 
right? So if you keep embolizing liver over and over and over again, eventually the hepatic artery is just thrombosed and you can't go back and the tumor always comes back, which is very frustrating, you know, because we have this very effective therapy and eventually you stop being able to do it. Um, so I mentioned that first patient only done 16 times, that was a personal record for me. I know people haven't been embolized 25 times, but the practical reality is that after half a dozen times or so, the hepatic arteries start to clunk off. Now when the tumors recur, they'll find blood somewhere and often what happens is they parasitize blood supply from other arteries that live around the liver. And we can find those too and potentially embolize those as well. But eventually everyone gets to the point where the, you know, what's left feeding the liver is so sparse that we can no longer catheterize it. And we try to stretch that as long as possible. All right, so conclusion of re-embolization. Toxicity is low, risk is the same. Response rates lag, meaning chemolization works immediately. The evolution of response to radiation is slow. It takes about three months before you see cha any changes on your scan. Um, and it's very expensive therapy. So each dose of the reactive beads, $15,000, just the dose. That's not the procedure. If you are a Medicare patient and you get your EOB, your explanation of benefits, if you get this one day outpatient treatment at my hospital, your Medicare bill will be $230,000. Now you won't have to pay that because Medicare will pay for that and they'll pay the hospital about one-tenth of that. So that's what the actual hospital actually gets for the therapy, but that's the spectrum of costs associated with it. Um, insurance is a huge issue for these therapies, so depending upon what kind of insurance you have and where you live, that may determine what kind of therapy you get because some insurance companies will pay for itching therapy but not chemo mobilization and some the other way around. So sometimes it's the insurance that determines what treatment you get. So it can be complicated. Okay. So tumor ablation, let's switch tasks now. So tumor ablation has to do with using a hydroprobe. Um, tumor ablation has not evolved very much since the 16th century. So if you go, if you have the privilege of going to the beautiful mountaintop town of San Gimignano in Tuscany, there's a uh, museum of torture, which I highly recommend. Um, my daughter and I enjoyed it very much. My wife and my son fled after the first room. Uh, but in there you'll see the iron spider. And uh, you'll also see the pear, which was one of the first endocavitary devices for placement inside people. And this was the brank, which is a, a device uniquely used for certain women, and I won't describe what they use that for. But if you look at the iron spider, the iron spider uh, was used, was heated in hot coals until the claws were red hot, and then you plunged it into the body and you grasped the tumor and you removed it, cauterizing as you went. And if you look at what the iron spider looks like, it looks an awful lot like a radiofrequency ablation probe. So in fact, 500 years later, the only difference is we stick it in you first and then we heat it instead of the other way around. <laughs> Other than that, ablation does not change very much. Okay, so what's the goal in treating liver metastases? We're, we're basically trying to reduce as much tumor bulk as we can and preserve the liver function. Good candidates for ablation are patients with a few small lesions. So it works very well for tumors under three centimeters in size and there's gotta be some practical limit, three, four lesions. You can extend it to larger or bigger lesions, but your failure rate starts to go up. And then some people are very heroic, but I think foolish in trying to go after many or very large lesions. Some other critical de decisions in treating patients with ablation. If I'm gonna do it percutaneously, I have to be able to see it. So it has to be visible under CT and ultrasound. If you can only see the tumor under MRI, I can't do an ablation inside a magnet, okay? Now, if I can't see it, maybe a surgeon can. So the same tools we use for ablation are available surgically. So some patients we have to do laparoscopically or surgically instead of percutaneously. Um, it, you have to have adequate clotting function, platelet count clotting time, and we also have to pay attention to adjacent structures. So if you're trying to burn or freeze something, you know, you want to zone around that tumor to make sure you get complete kill, and you have to be careful you're not getting bowel, gallbladder, diaphragm, major vessels, or bile ducts. Again, that's a situation where you know, if there's critical adjacent structures nearby that I can't avoid, maybe the patient should have this done in the operating room where they can take the, certain, the liver away from the heart or the lungs to do the ablation. There are many different devices you can use. So you can do a radio frequency ablation, which is sort of the traditional heater probe approach that's been around now for uh, you know, 10, 20 years. You can freeze the cryoablation, also an old technology. Uh, laser, Dr. Warner mentioned, is not available commercially in the US, but they have it in Europe. Uh, microwave is sort of the new kid on the block for heating. It's a more efficient heating system than radiofrequency. So you can get sort of faster burns that are a little bigger maybe. 
Um, and then there's still forms of chemical ablation, which we rarely use in neuroendocrine tumors. RF ablation is basically just an electrical alternating currents like the BOVI they use in the OR for cauterization. Uh, and basically the idea is you send this current in the patient, it causes all the ions around the tumor to, to agitate violently, that causes friction which causes heat. And the goal is to get the temperature above 50 or 60 degrees centigrade, at which point you get irreversible cell death. There's lots of different devices, as I showed you, in different shapes. Uh, and every, you know, there's multiple vendors. Every hospital will have one or two of these. And each has sort of its unique applications in terms of the geometry of the device that's appropriate to certain parts of the body or in certain anatomy. Um, so you know, that'll be up to the operator to figure out what's the right probe to use. Uh, cryotherapy, as I mentioned, has been around for a long time, both in prostate and open liver surgery. It uses argon gas, which rapidly freezes uh, the area around the needle tip down to minus 100, minus 130 centigrade, which is enough to be lethal uh, to the tumors. There's a couple different vendors out there. Basically, there's a, a, a machine that pipes the gas through, and then you have these probes. And the probes come in all sorts of different sizes and shapes. You can make round burns. You can make oval burns, bigger and smaller burns. You can kind of sculpt it to fit what, you, uh, what you're trying to treat. Um, and you can do multiple probes at once. So you, depending upon which vendor you have, you may be able to put in as many as eight cryoprobes at the same time and then do all your freezes at the same time. You also have to choose how you're going to get, get to the tumor. So ultrasound is very nice. If you can see the target under ultrasound, you can do it under real time. You actually watch the needle go in. You can use a complicated approach to avoid ribs and other organs. However, uh, it can be difficult to see the uh, probe and the target. And also, once you start cooking, you're literally boiling. You're cook it's like putting your you know, chicken liver in the oven. So you're literally cooking it. You get a lot of steam in there. And steam is a gas, and gas shadows that ultrasound. So once you start cooking, everything just becomes this ball of gas, and you can't see anything anymore. So if you're just doing one ablation burn, that's OK. But if your plan was to do multiple overlapping ones, it's difficult to position for your overlapping burns because you lose your view. CAT scan is a little bit more awkward to use to do this needle placement inside a CAT scanner. Your access is limited by the CAT scan gantry uh, and the fact that you can't scan from any angle you want to. On the other hand, once you're there, you can see the probe beautifully. Uh, you can do multiple overlapping burns and know exactly where your probe is relative to the target tumor. And then if you want, uh, or let's say maybe you're unsure if you actually got the whole thing, you can actually inject contrast of the spot when you're done and do a diagnostic CAT scan and see did you get the whole thing or not. Um, the problem with that is that there's a tremendous amount of hyperemia, you know, a reaction to the burn and everything kind of lights up and so I usually just scan about a month later. Side effects from ablation are minimal. It's an outpatient procedure. Um, the cooking part is actually painful, so for that part, we make you fall asleep. But afterward, in most cases, there's very little pain, uh, maybe a little fever. We just watch you for four hours like we would for a liver biopsy and send you home. Typically, Motrin's all you need afterward. Some people need something a little bit stronger. Uh, complication rate is extremely low, maybe 2 to 3% in aggregate. The main thing we worry about is bleeding from the liver. Leaders, le liver is a very vascular organ. Um, and so even though the devices are designed to cauterize the track as you take the needle out, you get major bleeding in 1 or 2% of cases. And there's a host of very rare complications that happen less than 1% of the time. As in many things in life, size matters. So this happens to be a report of treatment of colorectal metastases, but the same applies to really any kind of lesion in the liver. We do really, really well at controlling tumors under 3 centimeters in size. So for a tumor under 3 centimeters, you should have complete kill 80% of the time or better. Okay? But once the start lesion starts getting bigger than 3, you know, 2.5, 3 centimeters, you get 2.5 to 4, you start seeing more local recurrences. You get above 4 centimeters, you see a lot of local recurrences. And the problem is that the zone you can ablate with a single application of a heater probe is only so big. And if the tumor, the target you're trying to treat, is bigger than that, you have to do multiple overlapping burns to get it. And it's really difficult to do that geometrically. You know, if you're trying to ablate an orange with a golf ball, you have to do like eight perfectly placed ablations to get that orange with, some, with something that only ablates something the size of a golf ball. And doing that in a CAT scanner under ultrasound is really hard. So from a practical standpoint, you're just not going to get complete control for tumors above 3 centimeters in size. So basically, we like to use this for small tumors, not too many tumors. However, you can combine this with chemoembolization if you want. And if you chemoembolize first and then do an ablation, you can get about 80% local control for tumors up to about 7 centimeters in size. All right, so sort of summing up, I think interventional oncology provides durable therapies to control metastases in the liver. It's not a standalone procedure. It has to be integrated as part of a multidisciplinary team with surgery and other systemic therapies for long-term success. And combinations of liver-directed therapy, systemic therapy, such as the newer multikinase inhibitor drugs or PRT, is something that will be sort of studied going onward in the future. And thanks very much. <laughs>